This panel is um, about foundations, the academy, and think tanks in the 21st century. Um, we have some questions here. Um, Beltway-based think tanks are not only not the only foreign, foreign policy game in town. How should other actors, funders, foundations, the academy, respond to the changes in the think tank universe? What is the proper relationship between funders, scholars, and think tanks? And are there some sources of money, i.e. foreign governments, uh, that raise particular questions? So um, we'll start with Amy Oakes uh, from the College of William and Mary. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you, Dan, for organizing this conference. It's a fantastic opportunity. Um, so we've heard a lot today about the challenges of navigating the relationship between think tanks, the policy community, and the academy. And from where I sit, one of the continuing challenges um, is the gap between Washington, and I'm going to put in that category, both think tanks and policymakers, and the uh, university. So one policymaker admitted in a forthcoming article in International Security, quote, I take the occasional idea or fact from social science research, but find most of it is divorced from reality and so lagging events as to be unhelpful. Um, but unsurprisingly, I think that actually academic work offers insights um, that can and should shape important debates. After all, my colleagues Susan Peterson and Mike Tierney have found in the TRIP survey that if policymakers had listened to political scientists, the United States would have approached the invasion of Iraq in 2003 with greater ca caution if they would have invaded at all. Uh, at every stage, even after the surge, IR scholars were skeptical of the war, and this result holds even when we take ideology into account. Now, for better or worse, the reality is that policymakers pay a great deal more attention to think tanks um, than they do the ivory tower. Um, so how do we bridge the gap if we're academics and want to influence the policy debate? Um, one way to bridge the gap is um, to bring the university to the think tank. Um, so we can invite academics to be to engage the policy world as resident or non-resident fellows, to give talks, to author papers, or even to teach courses as Brookings has done. Um, the alternative, though, is to bring um, th the think tank to the university. So, for example, there's the Foreign Policy Institute at SAIS, um, and I, along with a colleague of mine, Dennis Smith, founded the Project on International Peace and Security six years ago at the College of William & Mary. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience with PIPS and what I see are some of the advantages and disadvantages of housing a think tank-like organization within a university. Okay, so the first thing I want to say is to acknowledge that PIPS is not the only model for bringing a think tank to a university. Uh, William & Mary is a primarily undergraduate institution. Um, and we operate within those constraints. So my fellows and interns, they're all students. Uh, but I do think that some of the lessons that we've learned over the last six years have a lot of utility. Okay, so just for a little bit of context so that you know what I'm talking about in terms of our organization, um, PIPS was modeled after nonprofit policy organizations in DC. And each year, PIPS selects um, six research fellows who are juniors and seniors. Uh, and six research interns who are freshmen and sophomores, and about 40 to 50 students undergo a very rigorous application process to compete for those 12 positions. Um, once we select the fellows, they spend the entire academic year identifying a policy challenge and then developing original white paper. Um, and the research interns support the work of their assigned fellow and learn the craft of conducting policy work and writing briefs. Um, in developing their projects, the PIPS fellows interact with visiting academics, members of the armed forces, representatives of a variety of policy organizations, including many of you in this room. Um, so they've worked with Department of State, FBI, U.S. Air Force Air Combat Command, CIA, American Enterprise, Cato, CSIS, Heritage, National Defense University, the Nixon Center, and RAND. So the culmination of the PIPS experience is a symposium in D.C., which we hold each spring. And the fellows present their ideas to representatives from the policy community, and then they field questions from discussants um, and then the audience. And we've held the symposiums at the National Press Club, at Brookings, um, and at the Carnegie Endowment, and on Capitol Hill. 
Okay, so that's the organization that I um, co-direct. Um, okay, so housing a think tank, I think at a university has several advantages. But there are all kinds of educational benefits. Um, we've observed that William & Mary students, I think like many college students, really actually want to engage in policy relevant work, but they don't necessarily know what kinds of questions to ask. You know, what, what security challenges do policymakers actually care about? And they definitely don't know how to present their work in a manner that would be persuasive to policymakers. So PIPS is, uh, it really focuses on giving students the skills to conduct the kind of research that we produced at a government agency or think tank, and then actually teaches them how to present their work um, to an audience of policy officials and scholars. Um, and we think that this applied approach to liberal arts training, um, which is at the core of PIPS, really encourages intellectual curiosity and creativity and hones students' analytical skills. Basically, we're producing the next generation uh, of analysts and scholars. And so I want to say that having worked with our best and brightest over the last six years, I have seen our future, and it is good. Um, OK, so PIPS is not just an educational program, though. Uh, our fellows produce uh, very high quality, original foreign policy analysis. I think we're often tempted to view students as recipients of knowledge, when in fact they can also be producers of knowledge. Um, and in fact, many of the ideas that our fellows have generated are quite significant. And members of the policy community have been eager consumers of their white papers and regular in attendees at our symposiums. Um, so we've had um, one fellow propose using sack farming to pro uh, promote urban agriculture in West Africa which is a $3 policy solution with the potential to substantially reduce chronic food insecurity and unrest. We had a student last year who uh, wrote a white paper assessing the threat from cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, um, and he recommended that the government introduce a new federal level license to encourage the growth of businesses that use these currencies and oversee cryptocurrency transactions. We also had a fellow who's in medical school right now, and she actually built an app that uses crowdsourcing technology to provide states with real-time data on epidemiological threats like Ebola. Um, so I think this track record of producing excellent work suggests that when guided by faculty and members of the policy community, students can actually make meaningful contributions to policy debates. And I think DC would greatly benefit from their <coughs> fresh thinking. Um, we've also seen that having a think tank in the university really helps to bridge the divide with the foreign policy community. Um, the program has, in fact, proved to be an important avenue for building ties between the university and D.C. Um, through PIPS, we've built relationships with officials and analysts at think tanks, the military, and the government. And a result of these connections, we've had speakers come back and give lectures. We've had students get new internships and research opportunities. We've made new contacts, which have led to research opportunities and being able to attend conferences in DC. And the college has um, hosted a bunch of strategy events with the military as a result. And if we take the long view, um, our fellows are only a year away from entering public service. Right? They are our future leaders, our future analysts, and before they enter the workforce, we can hopefully demonstrate to them the utility of producing policy-relevant work. And then, of course, some of them have gone on to um, PhD programs. Um, we have two fellows right now are at Stanford's, uh, in, at Stanford's graduate program. Um, and hopefully, they, hopefully, they're already convinced of the importance of producing policy-relevant work. Um, my sense is also that uh, we have a we have greater freedom to write what we want due to academic norms, even when we get outside funding. Um, we received a grant from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research to write a white paper examining the political, psychological, and cultural barriers to um, uh, the deployment of the active denial system, or ADS, and non-lethal weapons technology. And uh, the final report was circulated at OSR as well as the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Directorate at DOD. Um, and we were able to make it clear from the outset that as academics, we expected to have absolute academic freedom in making recommendations about weather and how to use ADS. And it was a condition that they accepted. I think they came to us knowing that that was going to be a condition, and then they accepted it. 
What was interesting, though, is that when we actually produced the report, there was some pressure to change its conclusions. Um, they particularly, in fact, they, they, they called us and, and scheduled an emergency conference call. Um, and they particularly didn't like the, the part where we suggested that um, ADS could become a tool of repression if it fell into the wrong hands. Um, but I do think it was somewhat easier to shrug off their demands because our work was done as part of a university program. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, the tenure system means that we can't be fired for our conclusions. And keeping my job does not depend on maintaining certain sources of funding. Um, and I also think that this academic freedom should increase the credibility of recommendations coming out of a university-based think tank um, because, precisely because academics are somewhat insulated from the pressure to tailor their message to the particular interests of funding sources. So I would argue that policymakers should be paying more attention to the work that's coming out of a university-based think tank. Okay, so that being said, there are some real disadvantages to housing a think tank uh, within a university. First, how do you get busy people in DC to come to an academic symposium, much less one where the, present, the, present, the uh, presentations are by undergrads? Um, I mean, just speaking from personal experience, we started with our ex extensive alumni network. William & Mary has tons of alums in the DC area, um, and we invited them. Um, and then we reached out to recruiters from the intelligence community and consulting firms and so on. And they came to the symposiums in the beginning because they wanted to see if they could employ our students. And in fact, that worked really well. I mean, our students came away with fistfuls of business cards, which is fantastic from their perspective. But actually, one of the interesting things that has been that we've seen our brand build over time. And so while recruiters came in the beginning, now regular staff from the same organizations come in order to hear the white papers. And so um, that's been really exciting to see over the last six years, is that people look forward to the event and then come back every year. Um, the second issue is that we face really significant funding hurdles. Um, we are lucky. Uh, we have had a lot of buy-in from the university. William & Mary really loves the program, and that's great. Uh, William & Mary, William and Mary basically pays for our core operations, so that's fantastic. But if we want to get funding to expand the program, um, that's an issue. Um, it means that we're competing with other programs and even the university itself for outside funding. Um, and if we want to submit um, a grant application, we need the university's uh, permission. Um, and lastly, the academy doesn't really reward uh, young scholars who invest in programs like PIPs. My colleague and I were lucky because we were able to frame PIPS as a unique educational opportunity, which William & Mary ate up. Um, but I can imagine that if you're an untenured faculty member in particular, you might question whether investing in or you know, managing an in-house think tank or even producing work for one might, might be wise. Um, and so unless policy work is valued alongside peer-reviewed research when one's evaluated for tenure, it's going to be built, difficult to build much momentum for this idea at R1 universities. Um, so just one last, one last point, um, you know, I do actually think that while PIPS was created for an undergraduate university, there is something to be borrowed from this model by other research universities. Um, certainly maybe not the educational piece of it, but the idea that you can have graduates, students, and faculty work together to produce policy relevant work and then go to DC and present it. Um, you know, you could have faculty just at your home university or invite other faculty. You could get together at the university and workshop ideas and, and invite policymakers and people from think tanks to come in. And then actually have an annual conference where you present this work and have, you know, really punchy TED talk like, you know, presentations on foreign policy, um, and it could be something that would be quite effective. So, you know, there are some drawbacks, but I think there's a lot of promise in the idea of marrying the academy and uh, think tanks. Thank you, Amy. Okay, let's move over to Ken. Oh, I should have asked for the order. <laughs> um, well, I'm not going to talk exactly along the lines of the questions that were proposed because I confess if they were sent to me, I didn't see them. So I'm just going to talk about what I want to talk about. Um, <clears throat> and I will say that I'm surprised in a way at how much self-criticism there's been uh, amongst people from think tanks, because my experience as a journalist, I've written about 
uh, think tanks a number of times over the last few years is that when you call, um, people are always sort of horrified um, that you're daring to raise questions about sources of, of funding. Um, and it'll be curious to me if down the road I call some of you in the room who have um, acknowledged that funding is a problem if when confronted or ask about specific cases, I tend to see uh, find that people aren't as, as open-minded about these things. But to me, it's a relief that people are talking about, oh, gee, money matters, because it's just, it's so obvious. I don't even, in, in a way that, like, why are we questioning whether we should question it? I mean, think tanks are really powerful institutions with big budgets and, you know, big names and you raise money, a lot of money, you don't disclose it very transparently much of the time. You brag about how much influence you have on policy and debate. And then you're like, oh, but, you know, gee, we're, uh, but, you know, beyond reproach. How can you possibly ask if, if, if money matters? Um, you know, if, if think tank scholar, oh, I should say, let me just say one nice thing. I don't mean to say, <laughs> at least one, I, Ken, please. <laughs> I don't mean to say, <laughs> only one. Make me feel better, Ken, please. I don't mean to suggest that everyone at a think tank is on the, on the take and that everything, that's stupid, of course. I mean, um, Danielle Pletka, who I'm sorry is still not here, um, I disagree with her on a lot of things, but I do agree that for the most part, you know, it's not that you get money to mouth a point of view you don't previously hold. I think, you know, it's like camp, it's like political contributions. The whole process is a whole lot more subtle than that, but money does play a role. If you're looking for money, um, if you're chasing money, it, it matters. Um, but I do want to just be very clear. I'm not suggesting everybody's just like a mouthpiece for their corporate funder. That's ridiculous. But let me be back, go back to being mean. Um, but, you know, think tanks operate in this sort of weird world. I mean, if, if lobbyists or politicians did what you all did, everybody would recognize it was wrong. I mean, they, and they have to disclose more. I mean, if you're a lobbyist, you, you actually, you don't have to disclose a lot necessarily, but you have to say who's paying you and what issues you're lobbying on. Um, if you're a politician, you have to say who's, who your contributors are, but think tanks, you know, no, we don't have to say anything. It's it's entirely our choice whether we reveal anything or not. Um, and I have written um, a number of times about the Center for American Progress. Um, <clears throat> and sorry, um, and like I, I called a got a year ago when I was working on a story. And Cap did not disclose its donors at all. It had a secret program to raise money from companies that, you know, was completely hidden from view. Um, and there was a very specific case where you had a lobbyist for Lockheed who was simultaneously, it is Scott Lilly, I do want to name names, unlike Danielle earlier. Um, Scott Lilly was a lobbyist for Lockheed and doing national security programs, or one of the chief national security scholars at Center for American Progress. How is this obviously not a problem? I mean, it's just an immediate appearance problem at, at very minimum. Um, <clears throat> and when I called though, you know, I got completely stonewalled. Um, you know, we're, a, we're not doing anything wrong. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to, we, no, we don't disclose donors. I'm not going to tell you anything about it. Um, you know, the lobbyist, that's just not an issue. Why are you even raising this? I mean, we're beyond reproach. I actually, um, it was quite interesting, um, and this is where you just go, come on. I mean, can you not see where this is an appearance problem at minimum? Lawrence Korb, who uh, was, I think, I don't know exactly what his title is, but he's a senior guy there on national defense issues. Scott Lilly is a Lockheed lobbyist and a CAP scholar, and, and he got paid to lobby on two, only two issues. One was to expand, uh, to, to, there was some restriction on the overseas sales of Lockheed products, uh, the fighter planes, the F-16s, I think, specifically. And he was lobbying on uh, more money for the Coast Guard. 
And CAP had done reports on both of these issues that completely tracked with what Scott Willie was lobbying on. And Larry, Larry Korb said, oh, you know, he never talked to me. I don't know anything about this. These were purely my ideas. And he actually said to me, you know, when I s said, well, this, gee, it sort of still, it looks bad. I mean, I don't know if you say so, but it looks bad. And he, you know, do you know who I am? I love when people say that. Do you know who I am? Is that a good answer? Like, am I, so, oh, yeah, sorry. I just, you know, stopped asking about this. I mean, even though the, the circumstances are, you know, anyone can see that this is potentially a problem. You just can't have this. Um, and in the end, after I published the stories, Cap said, we'll start, we're going to declare our donors and we're going to stop having lobbyists on our, on, uh, you know, on our payrolls, um, at least when they're doing it at the same time. So it was like, you know, for, for a month of back and forth, we're not doing anything wrong, we're not doing anything wrong. And then the stories came out and they said, well, we're, we, didn't, we never did anything wrong, but we're going to change what we were doing. So anyway, I just typically don't find that there's a lot of... Um, uh, self-criticism on the part of think tanks or understanding of why you you all should be looked at in a really serious way. You're influential uh, institutions in Washington. Naturally, you need to be scrutinized. Um, and the media, too. I will not exclude us. You're fair to ask all the questions you want about us. Um, <clears throat> but what I, what I think, you have a situation where um, because think tanks don't have to disclose their their contributors, I think there's no question that think tanks have acted as undisclosed lobbyists for contributors. Again, I'm not saying this happens all the time, but there's no question about it. I mean, again, uh, and I'm just going to pick on CAP because it's stuff I've reported on. I mean, CAP was taking money from a company called First Solar. Uh, they weren't disclosing it. This was totally, you know, until I reported it, this was not known. And meanwhile, they, you know, you had CAP scholars testifying before Congress and writing papers that very, very specifically uh, praised First Solar and talked up the company and, and talked up some of the company's initiatives. You know, look, that's called lobbying. That's just, there's just no way around it. And the, you know, if you at least you have to say, well, we're taking money from them, so that the consumer can say, well, okay, I need to know that. Um, but. You see this time and time again, um, and again, I disagree with Danielle Fletka on many, many issues. But you know, when she said earlier, <clears throat> um, you know, you have events in Washington about Kazakhstan, which again is something I've written about, uh, where you just, you know, you have a guy who was elected with ninety-nine point five percent of the vote in a completely bogus election, and yet you'll have. You know, and I'm, we're talking about the premier, what are thought of as the premier think tanks in D.C. hosting events that are completely preposterous um, about, you know, democracy marching forward in Kazakhstan. And it's like, gee, you know, somewhere in the, you know, with an asterisk, maybe they know, oh, yeah, this is paid for by Chevron or the Kazakh government. You know, why do you even, I mean, how can anyone even take such an event seriously? Um, how much time do I have? Sorry. You have about four minutes. <clears throat> and, you know, in terms of the way think tanks raise money, again, if you just look at it, if it were a politician, you'd instantly know that this was wrong. Um, but Brookings, and I'm, you know, Brookings and Council on Foreign Relations and CSIS, they all have these donor reward programs where the more money you give, the more they get. So um, Brookings has four levels, unless they've changed this. You know, where the chairman circle is $100,000 and up donors, and they get, and I'm quoting, custom, a customized program of benefits designed in collaboration with a senior director of corporate and foundation relations. Um, and there's another program where you get to meet with think tank officials, to discuss your specific goals. And here I'm quoting again, if you have a particular area of policy interest, you can support a specific research underway. And that if you want a deeper engagement, which means more money, um, that you'll get, um, you'll be able to meet with their experts who can draw up a research agenda that will, quote, maximize your impact on policymaking. I mean, that doesn't come close to passing the smell test. I mean, if you had, you know, when the, when the Republican Party or the Democratic Party says, hey, if you give us $100,000 and you get to go on a ski retreat with senators, 
it's like, oh, you immediately know that's just bad. But when think tanks do the same thing, they expect that, oh, you know, gee, how dare you question our intellectual integrity? I mean, really. Um, Anyway, since I'm running out of time, I'm not going to go on about, but you should all, I mean, take a look at those corporate donor programs. They are, to their credit, on the website, but it's just like, Sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes, right. But, you know, it's just a walking conflict of interest. Um, <clears throat> uh, I already talked a little bit about Kazakhstan. I talked a little bit about lobbyists being on, on, on the staffs of think tanks. Um, and... You know, this is often done in a way where it's just not disclosed. Uh, something that Brooke and I wrote about at one point, uh, Ian Brzezinski, he is at Atlantic Council, and he was setting up events on Eastern European energy and talking up very, very specific measures and proposals, and it turned out that he was lobbying simultaneously for a Polish energy group that, I mean, he was hosting events, setting up events, and talking up very, very specific proposals that he was getting paid to lobby for on the side. And not disclose, I don't think there was any disclosure of this at the events. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure not. Um, and another, just one last, oh, I'm down to one minute. One last thing, I think also, it's not just funding, but it's personnel. Uh, CSIS again, the head of their Southeast Asia program, is a guy named Ernie Bowers. Ernie Bowers also runs a consulting firm. It's called, uh, oh God, I forget what it's called. I think it's like Bauer, uh, Bauer, Bauer Group Asia. I mean, what he does is open doors for companies that want to do business in Southeast Asia. His client base, the countries he works in, it's virtually, it overlaps, I think, precisely or almost precisely with the countries that he covers at the Southeast Asia Studies Program at CSIS. I mean, if you are going to open doors for companies in Vietnam, it's pretty awkward if you're hosting a think tank that's really, really being critical of human rights abuses in Vietnam and not promoting engagement in Vietnam. I mean, to me, I don't even understand why you would think it was okay to do this and why this is almost never disclosed. I mean, you're, you're, you know, if Chevron, I'm just picking that name out of a hat, wants to do business somewhere, they're paying you. You have to be friendly with the government of Vietnam if you are going to open doors over there. So anyway, I think just across the board, there are so many apparent problems. And again, I'm glad people here are you know, saying, yeah, we, uh, money matters. But it's, um, you know, it's time to take a real close look at, at how the whole system works. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> We'll move on to Heather Hurlbrook. Uh, she's with the New America Foundation. Heather? Great. Thanks. Um, so I am actually going to work from the questions, Dan, so you can, you can feel good. I read them. But um, I'm going to tell you that you had it backwards in your question, so don't get too happy. Um, we were asked, you know, how should other actors respond to the changes in the think tank universe? And I'm going to humbly suggest that it's more the other way around. The think tank universe is and will continue to respond to changes in the broader environment around it. And so the real question is the dynamics we've been talking about today didn't just come out of nowhere. They came because of things that are happening in the rest of the world and will continue to do so. And um, actually, Ken, I'm going to be able to shorten my presentation by several minutes because that's exhibit number one right there. Um, everything Ken just said, there has been a massive change in our culture um, regarding expectations of transparency and accountability. And you may have whatever view you have of the substance of the issues that Ken just went through, but I would urge you to actually forget about the substance and just understand that that's the kind of scrutiny that think tanks are now under. And any idea that that somehow can be avoided or is inappropriate or is unfair, just get over it. Um, because this, you know, look, Journalism, um, the clergy, education, the academy, government, political parties, um, with the exception of business, even to some extent, you know, no American institution is trusted. No American institution is there an assumption, oh, these guys are generally doing the right thing and we can trust them and when they say they have our best interests at heart, we should believe them. So there is no reason for the think tank community to think that it's different. And this is, um, is gonna be the tone of the discourse around 
where think tanks get their money and how they spend it from here on out. So might as well get used to it. Um, and in a way, and this you know goes back to a point Rachel Bronson made this morning. Um, think tanks lagged for a long time, and you know people who have come out of other institutions that have been under scrutiny for for decades now, you know, can tell you talk to talk to a journalist about what this is like, or talk to a religious figure, you know, and so get some get some training in what it's like when someone like Ken shows up on your doorstep day after day after day, <laughs> asking impertinent questions. Um, Point number two is the change in the availability and volume of information that we have around us. And you might think, well, that's great for think tanks because it's so much easier to gather so much more information and you can do really amazing cutting edge work, you know, whether you're in Williamsburg or whether you're overseas or whether you're in Washington or whether you're in Boston. But in actual fact, uh, the flow of information has been has been bad for think tanks, and several people on earlier panels moaned about there being too much information, too much flow. There's no way think tanks can control or limit the discourse. Um, when I was running an avowedly left of center advocacy organization, uh, the National Security Network, we did a little study of how congressional staff got information on foreign policy issues. And what we found was um, staffers' inboxes were so full of think tank reports that they had just given up. And actually, personal connections were even more important than they were back in the dark days before the internet. Uh, because if you have to do your boss a policy paper on, say, Kazakhstan, and you have 10 different things to choose from, you're not going to read 10 policy papers or even 10 summaries of policy papers. You're going to pop down the hall to the guy who was a foreign service officer and served there or you know, maybe you know someone who went on a fishing vacation there. So oddly, human capital relationships, networks as we now call them, um, are even more important and that you know, creates an even bigger challenge to, to the traditional think tank model because it leads to this question of the conveyor belt, which Admiral Stavridis started us off with this morning and came up again in, in the last panel. Um, if your convey the, the think tank model, and, and you know, let's let's not um, get too romantic about this. The think tank model was built on the idea that leading thinkers knew leading policymakers because they had all been to the same schools together, they had all been in the same eating clubs at Princeton or secret societies at Yale or what have you, and so you all had lunch at the same clubs, and so it was pretty easy to disseminate your ideas. Um, I'll just add that they were all white and male, um, just because somebody needed to say that at some point today. Um, so, you know, that model um, had its strengths and it had its weaknesses and it had its policy disasters, um, and which, which largely informed the growth of the American people's distrust of, of institutions. So now you have growing a model as American political parties have sorted themselves out a little more ideologically. And again, national security lags domestic issues, but we're not immune. You know, we don't, we don't get to ignore gravity. So as American politicians have tended to, to be more um, ideologically sorted, um, more and more, and as um, Hayes and Kim said on the last panel, when you don't know, you don't have any idea what you're supposed to think about Kazakhstan. So you're gonna check what the political leader you trust thinks about Kazakhstan. You're gonna trust the, the political think tank. And you know, Heritage really pioneered this, and actually Kim, who's gone now, um, for better, for worse, didn't. But all of us um, to the left of center sort of look with awe, envy, and horror at Heritage, which sends out every day faxes, used to be faxes, now emails. Yes, I'm old, Hayes. Um, <laughs> you know, here's what to think about the issues of the day. And you can moan and groan about dumbing down politics, and but at least they're reading something. Um, and the way I used to think about this in my professional life was what you want is for those things to be a gateway drug, right? You want the paragraph summary to be sufficiently interesting that somebody sees a link to a Justin Logan article and says, oh, that's fascinating, I'll click on that. Or, oh, that's interesting, there was some research done on those weapon systems, maybe I wanna read it. And then that sort of, you know, and it's a hyperlinked model, but it is a very different model and it poses a challenge to poses a challenge to think tanks and networking the way 
they've been constructed. Um, next, just to talk about funding and to try to draw together things that we've said during the day, funding is more transactional. And that's not going to change. And that's not going to change whether your donors are individuals, whether your donors are corporations, whether your donors are foreign governments, or whether your donors are foundations. Um, again, a trend that the national security community has lagged but is not going to be able to avoid is um, foundations doing the work themselves. Um, on the domestic side, it's become a huge thing, and in some international areas where the foundation says, oh, we, wanna, we don't want, just want to be the program officers, we want to do the work, or we want to do the advocacy, you know, Pew, which brought almost all of its work in-house. So that, you know, then regardless of um, the propriety of any particular funding source or how you as an institution decide what, your, what the propriety of your funding sources is, you're going to be held more accountable for it. And there's going to be more interest in metrics and data than there was in the past, which for those of us who love um, qualitative analysis and maybe went into this line of work thinking that we could hide from you quantitative people, um, you know, this poses a real challenge. And you're going to lose out to other forms of research, other forms of inquiry that are more easily fitted into the funding model of show me the results, show me the graph. Um, two other trends I want to touch on in, in that regard, and, and one is the uh, disenchantment with Washington, which we're all well aware of. Now, um, Rachel also referred to this this morning, but there's a, there's a, a jargony word for it, and it's called glocalization. Um, and so the idea is that funding and advocacy and research and policy, that you either go to the local level or you go outside the U.S. and you kind of skip the morass that is Washington and the U.S. government altogether. I, I've never really recovered from having a Silicon Valley funder say to me, you know, we've kind of given up on Washington. And I said, you know, since you work on nuclear nonproliferation, that's really unfortunate. <laughs> Yes, I do live in the nuclear-free People's Republic of Tacoma Park, but I, I wouldn't, I would not advocate that as a as a useful policy approach. So, for um, I'll never think of grand strategy the same way again after this conference. But, but for those of us who do think that for better or worse, um, U.S. policy, national U.S. policy, still has a major role to play in world affairs, we have a big problem because we are out of fashion. And we don't control whether we get back in fashion or not. Um, so it behooves all of us um, to think about how do we tie into, how do we connect to tear down the silos between local, national, and global policy. Um, lastly, there is a generational shift, which I think it's important to mention here and here, and again, we've sort of touched on it over the over the day in a variety of ways. It is not, in my experience, uh, among the thought habits of the generation that comes after mine to assume that there is such a thing as objective, unbiased information. Um, the the sort of the question is, tell me your biases, and then I'll choose whether to consume you and how I think about consuming you. So the model that we can just insist more and more loudly that we don't have biases. Is uh, I think its days are numbered, um, and I think there are a number of institutions that whose leadership is very, very invested in the idea that they don't have biases, but that are seen by their audiences as as having biases. Um, and I'll also just say, as I see my time ticking down. Um, the next generation of donors is also going to be quite different. Um, and as I've mentioned, more results-oriented, more metrics-oriented, um, again, more of the kind of social entrepreneur, well, I just started a company in my dad's basement, so why can't you just fix gridlock in your dad's basement? Um, or, you know, I'm not really interested in X, I'm only interested in Y, and so I'm going to fund Y. And funding out of a sort of results orientation rather than the kind of civic obligation orientation that many of us cut our teeth on, got into this field because of. So 
you know, in the in the long run, there's lots of good news there. Um, the 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 market is exploding. The desire for ideas. You know, there are more markets to to sell and to express and develop and argue about ideas than than ever. So it's a fantastic time to be a think tank. But um, arguably, much of the construct of the large independent think tank that kind of dominates our imagination is increasingly going to be the exception rather than the rule. Thanks. Thank you, Heather. All right, we have one last panelist. I'd like to introduce Andrew Seal with the Wilson Center. Well, there's nothing like being the last panelist on the last panel of a very packed, uh, fascinating day. Um, I, uh, th th already much of what I was going to say has been said, so I will try and be quick so we can get to the discussion. But I do want to to uh, to touch on a few points, some of which will be repetitive, but hopefully some will be new. Um, I wrote an article last week, which Caleb will send around at some point um, to everyone, that is a uh, uh, starts off as for something called Sokolo Public Square, if anyone's ever read that. It's an online journal I commend to you. It's a fabulous online journal. It got picked up by Time on Friday on what, what think tanks are. It's called, you know, think tanks, what are they good for? Um, the editor's uh, title, not mine. Um, and it, it starts, however, with a Seinfeld quote. And at the danger of, of falling completely flat trying to do Seinfeld, it, it, Seinfeld has, has a skit on think tanks where he says, it's a tank that you think in. And then he sits, sort of like Rodin, and he sits there for a while. He says, it's time for lunch. He says, wait a minute, he's thinking. Right? And he goes, OK, I'm done, right? And he goes. And it, 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 I, I raised it in the, in the article, and I raise it here, partially because it's kind of funny, and it, it's a way to approach it. But it is also, I think, gets at something that we've been dancing around today, which is that the concept of a think tank is somewhat nebulous, right? I mean, think tanks are actually not a class of organizations. It, it's a conceptual class. But, but think tanks as such, how you draw the boundaries around what a think tank is, is something we, we feel we intuitively understand. But, but in fact, it is think tanks come up for multiple different motives. I'll get to that in a second. They come for, they have very different repertoires. They have different ways of acting. And, and frankly, though, we've been talking about a lot of the biggest think tanks, and most of us here that represent think tanks are from sort of the big, you know, inside Washington or inside major cities like Chicago think tanks. Most think tanks are actually not in those cities, and they're mostly based at universities, actually. Um, so, they're, you know, the, the universe of think tanks, depending how you define it, is actually fairly diverse. Um, and, and part of, of, I think, one of the challenges, I actually welcome the, the call on transparency. I will come back to that. I think it is important that we make sure that we do not be used as Trojan horses for business or government or even individual interests. Um, um, and I will talk about that in a bit. But I think one of the greatest challenges of being at a think tank is actually getting through some of the, the conceptual vagueness about what it is we do. And so I set out about three years ago, I set out to write a book on, uh, well, I didn't actually set out to write a book. I set out to try and figure out what it was that I did as a day job. I was running a program at a think tank at the Wilson Center. We did not call ourselves a think tank at the time. We still, half my colleagues don't call us a think tank. We're a presidential memorial. We are many other things. We're a center that hosts scholars. But let's face it, if it quacks like a duck, you know, it is. And we are a think tank, um, albeit a somewhat unusual one. And I was trying to figure out basically how it is that we do the process of, of having impact as an organization that, that works in the terrain of ideas. And I ended up writing a small book about this, actually a very small book, it's about 100 pages, called What Should Think Tanks Do? A Strategic Guide to Policy Impact. All the wonderful words we've thrown out today, right? Um, and I'm going to actually just track the five questions that are in that book. Not so much because it's the most interesting way for you to hear it, but it's the only way I can remember what I'm going to say to you. So um, the first one, you know, I, I was talking about mission and goals. Obviously, any, you know, basic management 101. I mean, you start with your mission and goals. You want to know what your organization's about, and you want to know what you're trying to achieve. And, and one of the things that the, the book says, starting out, which was not my term, it's quoting someone else, was, you know, start, start with the ending. Think about what it is you're trying to achieve, how the world will look different um, down the road. And I would say, you know, based on what we've talked about today, there are at least three different kinds of think tanks out there. There are some that are quasi-academic. They're actually the largest number, by far, if you include university-based think tanks. Um, there are some that are issue-driven, that, that really sprung up because people have a passion about particular issues. And there are some that are party or ideologically driven. Um, and two and three are actually increasing. The ones that are issue-driven and the ones that are, that are ideologically driven have been increasing in number. The quasi-academic ones are probably still the largest overall. Lots of small think tanks out there that fit that model. Um, the second question is about what you, I say no more about that one, but we've covered that most of today. The second one is, what do you do best? You know, and different think tanks do different things better. Um, they actually have different 
ways of acting, even though we sort of talk about it as sort of one set of organizations, there are think tanks that really want to shape policy decision making. The ones that come out of issue-based or ideological um, origins tend to have actually very good ties into people that make decisions. And they tend to be very good at rapid response. Those that come out of a more academic bent tend to be very bad at that, actually. We may think we're good at it. We're not good at that, actually, for the most part. They, they actually tend to be much better at doing things like convening people or framing issues, looking at the longer term and the medium term than at the short term. Um, the, yeah, I work at a, a think tank that, um, because it's congressionally created and partially congressionally funded, um, we actually try and do a lot of convening as a trusted space. That's, that's a lot of what we were created to do. We do a lot of framing issues in the long term. We tend to stay away from controversial issues, largely because we are congressionally created. But we also have, uh, it, since our origin's done, one of the things that I think think tanks can do well, and it's not just us, I think Brookings and Carnegie and others do this well, which is linking scholars and think tanks. Thinking scholars and policy, and this is one of the questions that you put in, Dan, for us. And, and I think it's actually one of the things we haven't talked about a whole lot here. It came up on the second panel a bit. But actually, you know, the, the incentives in academia have been increasingly against practical research, have been increasingly towards theoretically focused research. Some people like Dan have managed to, to bridge this very adeptly. But it, it, and the incentives in the policy world and in the think tank world have been much more towards, towards dealing with the immediate 24-7 news cycle right, towards dumbing it down a little bit. Actually combining academics with policy is actually a huge opportunity for think tanks, which is thinking how you bring, and, and we're set up for this partially with about 150 scholars that come a year, but we tended to have them come in and sort of do their thing and leave. For us, one of our realizations has been bringing in academics, figuring out how we can hook them up into the programming lanes we're working on, um, as well as sort of help them become better public intellectuals, turns out to be incredibly powerful because we tend to attract scholars that want to be in Washington because they have something to say. And there's a big question about how do you help them say that in a way that, that's strategic and useful while they're in Washington. Cato does this very well, by the way, as well. There's a number of think tanks that have actually figured out in their programming how to do this, but it's something we could probably, probably all do a lot better. And there's a lot of scholars out there who, though their tenure you know, based decisions and, and the, the disciplinary pressures are less about that, have a real desire to also contribute something to pol policy dialogue who will take advantage of those spaces. So let me throw that out there because that was one of the questions. Um, third question that, that we talk about in the book is who are your audiences and how do you reach them? And we've talked a little bit about this and I, I won't go into any great depth on it. Um, but uh, we, we've talked about policy networks and policy makers. I, I tend to think policy networks are more important than policy makers in the sense that you rarely are reaching, unless you are heritage or cap and you're deep in the weeds on politics, rarely are you able to reach actual decision makers. You're reaching policy networks. You're trying to reach people who are deep into the discussion. You're trying to reach journalists. You're trying to reach the general public. Um, a lot of what we talk about doing is both doing deep research, but then, I mean, we like to actually have people doing, all of us should be doing at least a book project at any given time, doing some deep research, but then slicing and dicing the research in ways that are usable for different audiences. Um, we've moved increasingly to new technologies like games, and Michelle mentioned that this morning, actually, um, how do you do practical games that allow people to play with things like the budget cycle or energy environmental trade-offs? Um, and as well as sort of new formats, we started a, a school for um, congressional staff on foreign policy, Republicans and Democrats who come in for a six-week session. It's not the kind of thing we did in the past, but we realized to reach congressional staff, it wasn't enough just to go up and try and brief them, much less than the emails. Um, which you were talking about, but is actually to, you know, in six weeks was doable, bring them in, give them a, you know, conceptual tools to think about foreign policy, give them very diverse set of, of points of view about foreign policy, and have them work through some real world problems, actually, between, and we have Tea Partiers and we have progressive Democrats in the same room, and we actually have them sit down trying to do problem solving together. Doing things in new formats that are outside the do research, publish a report, convene a meeting, has, has actually turned out to be very important. So, but thinking of audiences, how do you reach them, and, and you know, how do you not dumb down what you're doing at the same time in the 24-7 news cycle, at the same time that you, you continue to do serious research, but also begin to figure out how you get that research to your audiences in new and creative ways. Finally, what resources do you need? This one I'll take a little more time on because I think it's central to this panel. I think, first of all, human resources are, are critical in this. 
Um, we, I think, heard the m first mention of diversity a little while ago. Let me say that was actually my first one on this, which is we've identified that as a major issue, how you actually have diversity in terms of, of the scholars and the staff that you have internally. And, and diversity is race and ethnicity. It's gender. It's also age. It's also ideology. It's also disciplinary perspectives. So have, making sure you actually have a diverse group of people that are producing the knowledge inside because you actually get better ideas, not because you want to be politically correct, because you get better ideas. I mean, if, when you get people who have different backgrounds, who have different ways of looking at the world, it turns out you actually can produce things that are more interesting. Um, so for that, that, is, that has been a, a huge issue. Making better use of people inside and outside the building. And again, I'll come back to the fact, one, you know, we, we've made somewhat better use of people inside the building by, by helping some of our younger staff move into research positions. But actually using people outside the building, particularly scholars based at universities, independent writers and journalists, um, who have been at the Wilson Center as scholars has actually turned out to be a force multiplier, which is, you know, we would sort of bring people in, give them a place to write for a while, let them go. Turns out if you keep people involved over time, they're doing great research that we can actually be, be helping get out there. We, we serve a function of, of connecting that. So think of being force multipliers with other people that are doing great research. Think of career paths for younger folks. Financial, um, you know, finding allies who share your passions and want to fund it, but not chasing loose change. And this comes to Ken's work. I mean, the, you know, and I think we do have some real challenges on transparency and disclosure. Um, we've been somewhat saved by the fact, by our own incompetence, as I've joked a few times, which is that we never really got into the big fundraising. We're sort of now, for the first time, moving into trying to do serious, um, serious fundraising. Um, but uh, the reality is you do get into conflicts of interest. The reality is, is if you don't build the policies up front, you don't build the the disclosure and the transparency, you can get into serious problems with this. Um, we have turned down money I would say more than once, multiple times in the past year even for that matter, just conversations that we decided not to pursue because we did not feel it was a match um, and that there were reputational risks. Um, and we are a public trust, and so the, the, bar, the bar is high on, on how we go about this. Um, but this is a, a huge issue, and I think it's something we had a think tank summit earlier this year that a number of you were, this was a top of the line issue. I don't think there was an issue that the risk back in April, I don't think that, you know, there was an issue that, that had a greater, um, that, that generated a better discussion, because this is something that's on our agenda. I think we paid attention to this before, and we need to pay attention to it. Huge issue. But, but nonetheless, there's also a huge need to bring in people who do share, um, share the same values and the same interests. The, the caution is on how you do it. And there's a huge need to see if we can get back with two foundations playing a role with the core funding that they once did. A few foundations do this, but actually the move away by a number of foundations, and I'm not going to name names from this, has been a, a part of the problem that I think has led a number of think tanks to search for loose change wherever they can find it. And finally, I talk about partnerships and reputation as, as key resources in the book. The final thing I'll talk about is evaluation. I won't say that other than to say it's really hard to measure impact in the world of ideas. Um, we can talk more about that in the discussion if you want to. There are ways of doing it. There are some really creative ideas that I learned from other organizations, but it is a tough thing to do. Um, it is not as easy as, as measuring school lunches or literacy or other tangibles. That doesn't mean we should stop trying to do it. I think if you set goals at the beginning, it becomes easier to do it. And finally, let me say, I, you know, my sense is that think tanks rarely, with the exception of the politically engaged think tanks, um, which probably do a better job of this, most of us do not actually shape decision making in the policy world. We may have that fantasy, we don't do that, and we probably shouldn't. What we do do, however, which I think is important, is convening groups of people who would not meet otherwise and help frame issues in ways in the marketplace of ideas and the ways that can be useful and which set the context for how decisions are made. And th that I actually think is very powerful. It, it's two or three steps away, but it is setting the preconditions, the way we think about issues. And when we do our job well, we do it by coming up with new frameworks, new ways of looking at issues that really challenge people to think about things differently and challenge ourselves to think about things differently. We're not always, we're sometimes too lazy to do that, but when we, but when we actually get our act together, that is really our value added, is, is the convening people who would not get together otherwise and those new frameworks that allow people to see these old issues in new ways and see new issues before they, they become prominent as well. That's it. Thank you. Turn it over to questions. Would you like to start? Okay. So thanks to everyone uh, for bluntly keeping me awake during this last panel. You all did a great job. So you know, it's uh, it's a credit to you. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, 
the first is to Ken, and I think to, to a lesser extent to Brooke as well, because you have covered in the story. Maybe this is naive, but do you think that in some ways the stories that you've done are actually an example of the system working? Which is a title I really like. Uh, but, but in the following sense, which is, you're right, you've, you identified a problem, which was a question about transparency. But if anything, you know, everything I've heard from the last month suggests to me that in fact, even if there were qu you know, disputes about some of the aspects you're reporting, there was also an acknowledgement of, yeah, we have to step up our game on this stuff. So do you think there's actually going to be significant movement at least, you know, on this transparency front? Or are you more cynical about, you know, what's actually going to be done? Um, and to Andrew, can you talk a little more about these sort of innovative ways of measuring impact? Because I would like yeah. to hear about them. Sure. I just add a two finger to the first question, which is on on the media. How as media do you actually stop yourselves being biased as well? I mean, you know, yes, we come at this, you know, with an ideology, with a perspective, and, and to greater or lesser degrees, we are successful in removing that ideology from our kind of logical thinking about what makes a good policy, what doesn't. How do you do that in the media? Because um, of course, you also come at this with an ideology uh, and an opinion. And how do you actually also try and separate that ideology from your reporting of a story to ensure that it is equally unbiased to the extent that we can, any of us, reach that? Can we start, Ken? Um, well, just with your, the last question, I mean, just as people here have said there's no such thing as being impartial and that everybody has a point of view, of course, I do. We all do. I mean, as a journalist, I try to go after a good story. If, 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 if I feel like there's a good story, it doesn't matter who I'm going to report about, you know. And I try not to think, oh, well, I, that's a target I'd rather not go after. Um, but in terms of my own think tank reporting, I think I can fairly say that I've gone after, you know, think tanks main, you know, center of the road and on the left and the right. Um, I don't see going after think tanks as being an ideological issue. I mean, you know, if, if I were reporting only on heritage, I think it would look pretty bad because my own politics are left of center. Uh, you know, like, I obviously, I mean, anybody who's looked at my reporting, but I really try to report as much as possible on people I'm more sympathetic to or would normally be more sympathetic to because that's healthy. <laughs> it's fair and I'm a honest. bit different from Ken. Um, you will not ever find out my political um, opinion. Um, I'm registered to vote independent, and that's it. Um, and in terms of, I think I, I agree with Ken as far as the think tanks go, the ideological question, um, I'm not sure how that applies. But in terms of journalistically, um, I, I practice, uh, com used to be called computer-assisted reporting, it's precision reporting. Um, so I first usually gather data and documents, and I spend a very, very long time with them. And then I don't know what the story is, you know, until I've spent that time with them and done analysis. Uh, usually the, the reporting begins with a question or two. Um, but there are... There's a, a, a discipline within journalism, precision journalism, computer-assisted reporting, data journalism, um, that really, I think, enables us uh, to, to uh, have some questions and gather public records and data to help answer them rather than calling people and listening to what they say. Yeah, I, I want to ask you the same question I asked Susan, which is like, well, what do you think about where the question came from? I mean, it doesn't, you know, like, it, it, but this goes exactly to my point, right? Which is we're all under this kind of scrutiny now, and everybody is fair game for this. The media kind of question. should be under a lot of scrutiny. Yes. Mark my words, <laughs> scrutinize, mm -hmm. please, for all of us. Mm -hmm. We I, had. I, oh, oh sorry. Just, oh, I mean, <laughs> this is something that, you know never talked about, but definitely, I mean, the first piece, I wrote a, a story on Center, American, Center for American Progress that ran in the nation, and that started out as a piece for the New Republic, 
And I mean, <laughs> nobody's going to ever convince me that that piece didn't go forward at the New Republic. Uh, uh, or it, it didn't move forward for political reasons. I mean, there's no question about it in my mind. And that is that Neera Tandon, who's the head of the Center for American Progress, knew the head of uh, the ex executive editor at the New Republic. I mean, yeah, you should definitely be looking at media. Uh, we didn't answer it, Dan. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't know what will happen. Um, I've seen impact a handful of times out of 15 years of investigative reporting, all of an investigative, uh, the real impact only a handful of times. Um, uh, there's, um, I'm not sure what the status of it is, um, and I wanted to ask about it today. Um, there's um, an amendment, a proposed amendment in Congress to require um, uh, amped up truth and testimony um, requirements that would have uh, think tankers um, and others, academics, I believe, media, whoever testifies before Congress, um, disclose funding they receive. In this case, it's specifically foreign governments, but you know, it's a reasonable and good question. You know, why not other types of funding? Um, so if that if that goes through, that certainly is um, a change. Um, does anyone? Care? They, they sometimes ask that anyway. Actually, I've I've had to fill that out. Yeah. Before testifying, yeah, they some some committees ask that anyway. They they long have asked. Okay. Yeah, who does actually, it. I had a question. But, but about it's like, that, but it's discretional. Right? Okay. I I actually think there's a huge impact. I mean, on this, if I can say, I mean, I think the fact you've heard it today repeatedly, almost every think tank, and the fact that it was the probably the hottest item on our think tank summit agenda. I mean, is earlier in the year, even before the stories came out, but when everyone knew there was sort of research going on. Partially because for think tanks, I mean, our credibility is is our coin of the realm, right? I mean, the fact that that being able to people take that the consumers of information or the colleagues or however you want to call it um, take us seriously is actually the coin of the realm, right? That is actually what we are known for. If people do not take, the, so I think you're going to actually see a fair amount of of you know, people are going to take this very. Some will take it more seriously than others. Um, some will care more than others, but uh, but you will see a lot of think tanks respond to this. Um, I'll answer your other question, however. Impact. Yeah, I, I don't think there is a, you know, there, there is no single way that you can measure um, the, the impact of ideas, obviously. There is, um, and, and by the way, on the other thing, on, uh, on transparency, I'd say, you know, to some extent the think tank discussion on transparency is a subset of, I mean, think tanks are a subset of nonprofits, actually. Um, I, I very much come at think tanks from that side. Um, the, the same questions could be asked of universities, which are huge generators of ideas also. Um, and, and also, there's a lot of nonprofit organizations, including, you know, very middle of the road nonprofit organizations out there that produce a lot of research for policy that's used. So there's a, there's a lot of question on, on transparency and ideas generally. On, on impact, um, you know, there, Jim Collins wrote a little book for nonprofits of his good to great. He, he wrote a tiny little book. And he says, if you are, you know, if, if what you are if what you are doing as a nonprofit is measurable, then think like a scientist and measure it. If it is not measurable, think like a lawyer building a case, right? Which is a really interesting. So, so what you can do in, in measuring impact with ideas, there is no fixed way of doing it, but there are sort of ways of thinking about of structuring this in in a much more regular way. And so he says, you know, basically you need to think about you know regularly setting up goals at the beginning regularly monitoring, and you actually have to set up a regular time to do this, you know, whether you actually met those goals, if not, why, and if, if so, you know, what worked, if not, why was the context that changed, was it something you did, I mean, look at that. Um, and you actually have someone that you ha you're building the case for. And this is actually critical, because in the think tank world, I think one of the challenging things that happens, this is true in a lot of nonprofits in different ways, we are kind of our, the judges ourselves about whether we are successful or not. I mean, the think tank people, like professors at universities, are kind of solo actors quite often. The institutions may not be, but individual researchers and what they do are often solo actors. And so actually having someone that you have to make the case to about why you are moving towards some sort of impact or have had impact or haven't is actually crucial. So you can either set that up within the organization, you know, have someone within the management structure who is that boards, advisory groups, you know, some, but you almost have to have someone you make the case to, who is your, you know, who is your BS tester, if you don't mind me saying. I mean, you know, someone who's, who actually, uh, and, and regularly gives you feedback, someone who you trust who is actually going to push back and say, I don't see this. And then the question is, do you see any imprint 
of the ideas that you're dealing with out there? I mean, can you see them having any sort of reverberations anywhere out there? Um, and depending on what you set as your goal, then you know, it depends what you're evaluating. There, it's, it's an imperfect method, but the, the key is you have to be systematic about it. You do actually have to have a thought out ahead of time, what are your goals and who's the group that you're gonna actually make the case to. If I could jump in a little bit on that, that point, actually, the, the thing that has been, I think, most absent to date is if you start to do even the, the kind of evaluation that, that you're talking about, you have to specify what you think your conveyor belt is. Mm -hmm. It can't just be we put cool ideas out into mm -hmm. the ether and people pick them up. And it's an incredibly valuable process. And from the funder's point of view or the public's point of view, it, it's you can evaluate a lot about how effective an organization is from whether they have a, a theory of the conveyor belt that seems even remotely plausible, yeah. frankly. And so in some ways, just doing that. But then um, there are, and these are, are resisted in my experience pretty strongly by many both think tanks and um, foundation funders, but there are plenty of metrics. Who's reading your stuff? Yeah. Are the people who are reading your stuff the people you say you want to be reading your stuff or their assistants? Um, who is calling you? Are you getting more calls than you used to be? Are you getting more invitations to talk in front of policy? So there are plenty of ways of, of um, coming up with some quantifications, but, but the interesting thing is that, that all of the quantifications fall more on the advocacy side than on the, well, I had an idea today side. So in some ways, just the demand for, for evaluation and for metrics pushes you, sort of blurs the, uh, the advocacy boundary that we heard some, some passionate commentary about earlier in the day, because you can't, you can't show impact if you can't show how you're trying to have impact. There's a, yeah, it's good tracking. I don't know, sort of separating outputs and outcomes, yep. actually, yep. Um, which was someone else's idea, but it's great to quote it. Um, separating you know, inputs, outputs, outcomes, and but you should track outputs in a, in a really rigorous way and then try and actually track outcomes in a rigorous way, which is obviously less quantifiable. But a, a great um, a colleague that I interviewed at one point who said, you know, we, we keep track of our media hits. I was saying, you know, and it, it's great, and you always feel proud when your media hits are going up. But she said, you know, when we do our regular evaluations, the thing I care about is not how many media hits, but what what are they actually covering? Because we actually are trying to get certain ideas out there. So if they're just mentioning us, that's flattering, but that isn't really what it's about. And it probably helps our fundraising, it probably helps our image, but in the end, that's not as good as we get fewer hits, And but the people are actually getting the message out. And so, you know, people who are good at this sort of separate, you know, they, they track outputs, but they also really ultimately care about the outcomes, and they, they try and separate those two in their mind. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask Ken a question, and Brooke, I guess, too. Um, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, and I basically agree with the idea that having a person being paid to be a lobbyist and being paid to be a think tanker and writing about how the incentives of the person for whom you're lobbying are actually in the national interest is icky <laughs> um, in some broad sense. But the academic literature, if we're sort of treating think tanks as lobbying groups or substitutes, close substitutes, for lobbying, it's interesting that the academic literature on lobbying and policy change basically says that lobbyists are really good at suckering clients into giving them millions of dollars, and the best predictor of success for a lobbyist is whether or not they're defending the status quo. And if they defend the status quo, they have much higher success. And if they're trying, if they're going up against an incumbent, or even if they're trying to, if there's a sort of null set and they're trying to get something enacted they're just sort of icky rent seekers, right? They just enrich themselves and buy houses and falls church and nothing changes. So is, is that something you sort of, so again, I, I agree with you generally on the point that you're making, but if you're using think tanks as a substitute for lobbying groups, maybe think tankers like lobbyists are just really good BS artists and rent seekers and you get to shake the president's hand and sit down and everybody's wearing dark suits, but maybe it's just noise. Um, well, that's a good question, and I think there's no qu there's no question at all that lobbyists completely snooker the clients, especially, I think, foreign clients. I do think lobbyists can not make policy but shape and influence policy. But, you know, if you're lobbying for Saudi Arabia, you know, the U.S. is just not going to break relations with Saudi Arabia currently. I mean, 
Larry Korb, who I was previously saying not terribly nice things about, said something a long time ago, which is that, you know, if Saudi Arabia uh, had artichokes instead of oil, we wouldn't have this close relationship. And obviously that's true. And, you know, given current realities, um, fracking or not, you're, we need their oil. So I'm sure the lobbyists for Saudi Arabia are telling him, thank God you've got us on the payroll because otherwise you guys would be in big trouble, which of course is completely false. Um, but even if you're right, that doesn't change just the fundamental dynamic here, which is that if you're a think tank and you take money from Lockheed, you should disclose it, period, mm -hmm. whether you've got a lobbyist mm -hmm. on payroll or not. I don't know how, it's hard to measure their impact. Um, I don't know if they're making a difference, but just if I am calling Scott Lilly for comment on national security policy, I would like to know that Lockheed pays him. <laughs> it doesn't anymore, apparently, but it, it did for many years. Can I just say something about sort of how this has changed in recent years, just because it, we talked this morning about the funding crunch that a lot of think tanks are under, and you have fewer and fewer think tanks that give sort of tenured spots to experts regardless of what you're working on. And more and more you have to bring your funding with you, you have to kill what you eat or eat what you kill. Or, so that creates an environment where more and more people are going to be combining think tank spots with other forms of employment. Um, and that is kind of a secular trend that's separate from lobbying per se, but it's gonna raise you know every kind of conflict of interest there is. And in my somewhat limited but possibly representative experience, um, the range of policies on limits on other kinds of employment you can have, disclosure requirements on other kinds of income that you may earn. Uh, some places have very stringent requirements, other places have no requirements whatsoever and you can do anything you want to generate income. So uh, again, uh, like everything else we've been talking about, the future sort of demands educated consumption. And, and there will be sort of pressure and shaming for institutions that don't, um, that don't disclose, but we're gonna see more of this rather than less. I think the question about is this noise, I, I, there's certainly, there's noise, that's for sure. But I mean, testifying before Congress, um, lawmakers citing policy papers by think tanks, even language being similar in a policy paper and the bill that is brought to the floor. Um, so it's not all noise. The, it's, they think tanks are certainly shaping policy. And I wanted to ask you, um, Andrew, um, you mentioned that, that the Wilson Center doesn't shape policy per se, um, but you also you know, talked about testifying before Congress, yourself even. Um, and so I'm just, I, how, how is it that the Wilson Center doesn't shape policy? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I didn't say we don't shape policy. I okay. said m many think tanks, including us, I think, are not very good at shaping decisions. As decisions. They're we're not in the, the ground battle, and, and we're very cautious as a congressionally funded organization. We have to be very cautious about that. Mm -hmm. But we do shape frameworks. Okay. Right, and, and frameworks ultimately, I mean, ultimately do have an impact on how people make decisions. Mm -hmm. And so, what are frameworks? Uh, how do you look at an issue? I mean, there mm -hmm. is, you know, a, a, I used to work on Mexico, a rise of violence in Mexico. How do we understand the rise of violence in Mexico? How do we understand the U.S. role in the rise of violence and, right. and you know, a way we could approach it? We tend to stop it at giving specific suggestions on how to do it, but we do frame it. And, and framing, and that's what I said at the end, framing is powerful. I mean, it ultimately does shape how decisions are made. Do I you mean, have a policy not does. to um, give policy recommendations? I yes. know some think tanks yes. do. Why do you have that policy? Because we're congressionally uh, mandated organization, so okay. it's actually in pro prohibited. It's in, prohibited. Our, it's in our language, yeah, in our charter language. Yeah, Even though no, we're primarily, case, you know, we're, we're yeah, we're, um, we, we can have our visiting scholars can take positions. I mean, and, and look, there's a fine line in this. I mean, like everything here, it's, it's not clear. We, we've talked about policy options, for example, quite often. Sometimes we'll do policy options, which is a vaguer term. Someone more cynical could say that sounds an awful lot like a recommendation to me. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, policy options is a little bit more open. I mean, we're, we're, we're sort of conscious that these, these are sort of fine lines here. Um, we're much more, we don't have problems with our visiting scholars taking positions, even strong, even specific positions, because 
you know, they're doing their own research. I mean, they come to the Wilson Center um, to do their own research, and if they choose to, most of them are doing much more academic research, but if they do choose to take a position, or they're independent journalists, um, you know, that, that doesn't worry us. But institutionally, for staff to take a, a, a position on a specific policy, a specific bill, mm -hmm. a specific executive order, um, we, we try and stop well before that. Yeah, but I, but, I, but I admit it's a fine line. I mean, and I'm sure we, I'm sure people could call us on, on crossing that line once in a while. Amy has a flight to catch, so I think unfortunately we need to. Caleb is threatening us with his arm there, so. Uh, is my taxi yes. here? Yes. <laughs> Definitely have to. And with that, thank you, everyone. <laughs>